I'm pleased to introduce the next session, which is Drs. Emma Espina and Marie Weston talking about how do NZ trained general surgeons secure an SMO job? Are we effectively training our tra retaining our trainees? This is obviously an area that is important to us. Uh, Asam's work is not just about fuddy duddies like me, but actually the next generations coming along who will be taking up, picking up the baton and running with it. So I'm looking forward to hearing the research from these two colleagues, uh, and I'll hand over to them now. Thank you. Um, so, 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 Hari Kotna, Kaishuki, so, Kawane no Yakota, Kotuna Kotahi, Emmy Noe, Kinama Latino, Okurumina, Big Farm Kinakoro, Kubaka Refinery, Mina, Sparta, Kurate, Mina Ibutako, Okinoku, Kobayo, Kiri Tina, Nona Tiko, Mina Tutuku, or Emmy Espinaho. To everyone, my name is Emmy Espina, and I'm a PGY1 House Officer at Middlemore Hospital in Auckland. My name is Marie Weston and I work at Middlemore Hospital as well. I'm a colorectal one general surgeon there. So we're presenting our qualitative research titled How New Zealand Trained General Surgeons Secure Their First SMO Role. Are we effectively retaining our trainees? This project was conceived in the theatre corridor when I was expressing my frustrations about the recent loss of two talented, newly qualified general surgeons to the UK. Both had been my trainees, both I'd poured a lot of work into, and both were very keen to return to New Zealand. But unfortunately, they were both snaffled up by lucky hospitals in the UK and Australia, never to return. And it had just dawned on me that all my efforts training them were in fact not for the benefit of New Zealand. I felt discouraged and then rage, not at them, but at the system. Why doesn't New Zealand fight harder to keep these doctors? Anyway, Emma just happened to be in the corridor that day, a med student at the time, and picked up her ears as I was going on about how we needed more evidence to wade in the hospital manager's faces. Her background in executive recruitment and politics and her love of hearing candid stories about people's <laughs> interesting lives, it just seemed like a good fit. So here we are, a qualitative study investigating how New Zealand trained general surgeons secure their first SMO job with a view to what can be done so that we might hang on to more of those that we've worked so hard to train. We have no disclosures other than the obvious, no haircuts for a long time in Auckland. So we've put this pink <laughs> wall here to try and distract you from that. <laughs> so for those in the audience who are not used to how general surgical training works, it's very long in summary. Uh, most start after PGY4 or above and there's a part one exam, part two, and for some lucky subspecialty trainees, there's a third exam after that too. Uh, trainees move city every one to two years, and after finishing the five-year training program, almost certainly spend another two or three years doing overseas post-fellowship training. It's estimated that the cost to the New Zealand, tra New Zealand taxpayer to train one surgical trainee is around half a million dollars. So to provide some context, we first looked at some data from a few sources. We started with the AESMS, you guys. So the New Zealand Medical Specialist Workforce is estimated to have a shortage of approximately 1,000 specialists overall, with the shortfall in most specialties expected to widen over the next 10 years if current rates of training and retention ret remain static. ASMS predict the potential consequences of this shortage could include reduced availability of services due to longer wait times to see specialists or receive treatment, increased thresholds for treatment, and the perpetuation of already high levels of burnout amongst specialists. There are implications for health equity, taking into account the existing unmet need and inequitable distribution of health care for Māori, which could worsen if access to specialist care reduces. Historically, New Zealand has trained too few doctors for projected health workforce needs, in addition to experiencing higher attrition rates relative to other countries in the OECD. To counter that shortfall in locally trained doctors, New Zealand employs the highest percentage of international medical graduates, IMGs, in the OECD, with IMGs comprising 42% of the doctors registered in New Zealand in 2019. This is not a unique to general surgery problem, and it's not a new problem. Next stop was the Medical Council. Data collected by the Medical Council shows that historically, peak rates of attrition of New Zealand medical graduates occurs at six to 12 years following graduation, around the time they qualify as a specialist. 
The majority of New Zealand trained doctors practicing outside of New Zealand are in Australia. In 2017, that number was 2,054, with smaller numbers leaving to work uh, around that time in the UK, 185, Ireland, 27, Canada, 113, and Israel, 5. And lastly, the Health Workforce Directorate at the Ministry of Health. So we met and spent some time with Emmanuel Joe, who's the Manager of Analytics and Intelligence there. He's been doing some comprehensive modelling for some years now, tracking the movements of New Zealand doctors and using this to forecast numbers and demand. We know that general surgeons, like other specialist groups, are facing an increase, increasing workload in the future. He gave us these complicated graphs which I'll try and explain. We'll start with this one. So this shows the uh, workload rising over 10 years. You can see on the, on the horizontal axis, there's the years there from 2019 to 2029. The blue line represents the number of surgeons and the red line is the um, number, it, it's it, by FTE. So they're not quite the same number. And that shows that steadily increasing number of discharges per general surgeon. It's showing us increasing workload over time. This is a really complicated graph he gave us too. Um, on the left is the surgical people and on the right um, is the FT by FTE. And that's again showing the dis distribution of the age of everybody uh, and the number of each um, age group and how that changes over that 10 years. But I guess it's easier really to just look at up here in the top right corner of both, you see the absolute numbers of general surgeons in 2019, 292. And there's only 14 more by 10 years time. And over here, it's the same sort of thing with FTE. There's only 20.5 FTE added over that 10 years. And so what that means is that when you take into account the um, workforce losses through retirements or jobs overseas, the demographic skew towards older age profiles, population growth, that the general surgeons in 10 years time will be doing 9% more work uh, than we are at the moment. And this assumes that those surgeons will be accepting of the work hours and the conditions of the existing SMO workforce. So in summary, Given the apparent vulnerability of New Zealand trained doctors to being recruited to hospitals in other countries during the final years of specialist training and post-fellowship training, the study seeks to understand the factors at play when New Zealand trained general surgeons secure their first SMO role. As Emma here did all the hard work, interviewing, <laughs> transcribing, theming, writing, she will take over from here and explain the study and what we found. Kia ora, Emma. Thanks, Mary. So <clears throat> semi-structured interviews were undertaken with 16 general surgeons who were at least five years from receiving their FRACS. So that was giving them time to have completed their post-fellowship training and settled into an SMO job. Uh, the participants work in New Zealand and internationally. Our interviews were transcribed, coded and themed, uh, and thematic analysis was used to interpret the findings. So six women and 10 men were interviewed. 15 attended New Zealand medical schools and one attended an international medical school. Five are currently employed as SMOs internationally and 11 work as SMOs in New Zealand. Um, we've deliberately avoided further subcategorization of the demographic details of the participants um, to protect their anonymity. This is a small group um, mm. and we wanted everyone to be as candid as possible with us. So we identified three things, which I'll take you through now. So the first one here, I think I'd have taken any job I could have gotten. And this tells us about the desperation felt by trainees in securing a job, um, a lack of options in New Zealand and uncertainty driving their uh, employment choices. So this tells of our participants' experience um, of reaching the end of subspecialty fellowship training um, and negotiating opaque rec recruitment processes um, living with a fear of job insecurity, and then the compounding impacts of potential unemployment and the years of moving around New Zealand and internationally, uh, and the impact of this especially on their families. So a majority of our participants describe uncertainty about future employment during their post-FRAX subspecialist training, impacting on their choice to work in New Zealand or internationally as an SMO. Um, I guess it's important to say that, you know, 
participants, they absorb a certain amount of uncertainty as an expected part of the pathway to becoming an SMO. Um, but that, that the longer, the further along the pathway you get, the harder that gets to, um, to accept. And the lack of job security at, at, at the point end, so as fellowship training comes to an end, that prompted most of our participants to take the least bad job that was available. Uh, the majority, so 62%, were offered SMO job opportunities while on post frax fellowship training uh, at international hospitals. Thank you. To my assistant. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, so the, th the second theme, it's who you know. Uh, so building relationships and networks is a key part of securing an SMO job in New Zealand. So this identifies the role of clinical mentors in facilitating SMO positions for trainees that they have worked with in the past. This theme also explores the perception that hospitals will find a way for candidates that they like. Um, that's considered to be a very small number of trainees um, and that everyone else is pretty much on their own. And a distinction is made between people who actively cultivate relationships. So the ones who remain in touch with the hospitals that they worked in um, and those who are actively promoting themselves to senior colleagues. And then, and those who don't have a plan or aren't temperamentally inclined towards putting their efforts into maintaining or establishing those relationships. Um, so, while perceived as beneficial to securing a job in New Zealand, these mentoring relationships in no way guarantee a position. They are understood to be necessary but not sufficient to employment, uh, with other factors ultimately determining whether participants were offered roles as SMOs. Um, our participants understood surgical departments as allies, um, but also knew that they were not empowered to make hiring decisions autonomously. And our third theme really captures um, kind of all the other bits. <laughs> um, so personal interests, values, and passion uh, drives both fellowship and employment choices. So this really focused in on the ways that a trainee general surgeon combines individual preferences based on their background, their identity, their interests and values to select fellowship training placements, and then how this contributes to employment choices down the track. Um, and it also investigates the way that participants conceptualise their relationship with New Zealand as home um, and as somewhere that they would like to work. So while each of these factors um, played a role in our participant uh, decision-making process, irrespective of their final country of employment. The overwhelming and most dominant factor uh, was the difficulty in identifying available roles in New Zealand and then navigating the social, political, bureaucratic systems in order to secure the role itself. Um, so two main approaches to recruitment were experienced by our participants. So the first is where individuals are groomed, so people, <laughs> um, people that have worked within a department um, for the job, they, um, they're a known entity um, who are perceived as someone who will fit with the values or culture of that department. Um, and the other approach was casting the net wide, so advertising for a position and going through due process to identify the best candidate, the best available candidate. Um, I think this is worth exploring a little bit because you know both approaches have risks and benefits um, and it's actually unclear which is most likely to improve the retention of New Zealand trained general surgeons um, based on the literature reviewed for this paper and the feedback of our participants. So selecting individuals for um, who have worked in a particular department is more likely to ensure a good cultural fit uh, with existing team members but equally it might overlook promising candidates who's qualities are less readily appreciated. <laughs> um, but for example, through differences in gender, ethnicity or interpersonal style, um, attempting a completely objective process on the other hand might capture a larger pool of candidates, um, of qualified applicants, but it also has the potential to overlook valuable insights which actually come from on the job awareness of a candid candidate's attributes and team fit through direct experience of working with a trainee. Um, and I guess the, the role of relationships um, that we've identified um, in our second theme uh, in securing New Zealand-based SMO roles actually highlights a lack of organisational accountability where organisations have left a gap in formal processes and pathways which has potentially allowed for relationships and implicit biases, for example, gender stereotypes and racism, uh, to flourish in their decision-making influences. So 
it's apparent from the literature and from this research that there is no clear accountability for workforce development in relation to the general surgical workforce. Um, <clears throat> tension between surgical departments who might, in an ideal scenario, prioritise securing talent well in advance, face the bureaucratic constraints imposed on the public hospitals uh, and DHB non-clinical leadership, who are in turn limited in their ability to support long-term budget allocations for staff. Uh, our findings suggest that there are potential solutions which would increase the retention rate of New Zealand trained general surgeons. Um, and I see that we've grouped them into three main categories, but there's four there, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> so we've grouped these into four main categories. Um, first of all, there needs to be clarity around whose responsibility it is to do workforce development, whether it's individual surgeons, surgical departments, DHBs, government, or a coordinated combination of all the above. There is more to it than money. Remuneration is a factor, but it's secondary to other variables, such as the ability to practice surgery as the SMO prefers, um, whether that be academic, subspecialty or broad generalist, quality of life and team fit. People need certainty. It was distressingly apparent that the logistical challenges and the feeling of being forgotten about by um, the college, by the New Zealand public health system, were the primary sources of stress for fellows looking to secure an SMO role. And finally, hospitals need the ability to plan long-term. If hospitals were able to secure a job for a promising trainee prior to their departure for post-frax post subspecialty training, this would mitigate many of the issues experienced by our participants as they sought their first SMO role. Um, so the strengths of this study are in the strong concordance of findings among the participants, and that permitted a deep exploration of the factors at play when a New Zealand trained general surgeon decides to take an SMO role. Uh, and the contribution that this research makes to a poorly researched area. The variables which might convince or deter an SMO in their career choices are unique to this group and to some extent the specialty that they've trained in. This research therefore provides an insight into the situation which has now been lacking until now been lacking in the existing evidence base. Uh, that sort of feeds into the limitations in some ways because you know a lack of relevant studies with which to compare these results um, uh, and also the constraints of confidentiality, which we mentioned, and that limited our, our potential to fully articulate in this paper the unique personal factors contributing to each participant's experience. While the gender split among participants accurate, accurately reflects the composition of the SMO workforce, um, while still allowing a ratio of women to men from which insights could be drawn, uh, the study lacked diversity of ethnicity. Um, and that's uh, an unsurprising result given the lack of ethnic diversity in the current SMO cohort. Future studies could look at a different cohort of fellows and compare any improvements or changes. Um, there is also the, the potential to apply this research protocol to other specialty areas given the urgency of the specialist deficit across the broader uh, doctor workforce in New Zealand. So this, in summary, this research has highlighted the costs of not retaining New Zealand trained general surgeons. While international medical graduates will likely always be required to complement the New Zealand medical workforce, the increasingly competitive global marketplace for medical professionals should caution against relying on this pool of candidates to fix shortages um, in our own workforce. Uh, the failure to retain New Zealand trained general surgeons in the New Zealand specialist workforce is amenable to improvements in workforce planning, improved coordination between clinical and administrative leadership and DHBs, and better career development support for trainees prior to re receiving their FRACs uh, and embarking on post-fellowship subspecialist training. Further research into the experiences of trainees and SMOs in general surgery and other surgical subspecialties is required to build a complete picture of the path from trainee to SMO uh, and the areas where interventions could improve retention of New Zealand trained general surgeons. Kia ora. Kia ora kōrua. thank you for that talk. We have been looking forward to that for some time. And here's a first question from left field. Marie, are you on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. No, I'm far too busy to look at that. <laughs> That's all right, we were just checking. We didn't want to tag the wrong Western. Um, oh, yeah. Definitely so... not on Twitter. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a, a handful of questions and comments for you, and I really would encourage um, our attendees to use Slido to engage while we have some time with Emma and Marie, because it's true, you're both, for various reasons, extremely busy, so it's fantastic to have you here with us this afternoon. 
Um, first, I just want to acknowledge Pauline Korpu has sent you a greeting, Emang Mihi Nui, and Christine Elder, who's a radiation oncologist at Auckland, says, excellent talk. This concern occurs across many specialties, and there is a scary mismatch between future predicted workload and FTE for radiation oncology, and the DHBs do not always fund positions commensurate with clinical need. I probably hearing the cries of pain and agreement um, from your colleagues across a range of specialties um, hearing this, but do you want to just amplify or comment further on, on Christine's remarks? Because I guess one of our own questions is, do we need to look at replicating research like yours across a range of specialties, or do you think it's kind of a done deal and your look at general surgery may well speak for all? Kilda, and thank you for those comments. Um, yeah, I think there's some, you'll be able to generalise some of the things that we found, but um, each specialist training pathway is unique. So there would be value, I think, in, um, in having a look at those different specialties individually, um, because it is very, you know, you're talking about quite small numbers in the end, even though they're significant um, as a group. Uh, and so you'd want to make sure that any levers were really tailored to that group. I think probably the um, one year focus on budget planning at a time is applicable to all across every subspecialty though. Mm. Um, that's the incredibly frustrating part about uh, planning your own department. Um, and I'm sure everyone has the same frustrations with that. So. Well, the good people from Health NZ, the Māori Health Authority and the Transition Unit tell us that one of their aims is to look at long-term funding uh, for health and getting out of that cycle of um, annual reporting and annual accounts in that way. So um, maybe there's some light there. Look, um, Claire French, who is a surgeon at Wairarapa DHB, says two questions. Uh, one, did every candidate do a further fellowship training of some kind after completing their training and passing their exams? And two, rural general surgery in New Zealand is perceived as an area of need for RACs. How are, these, how are those jobs perceived to New Zealand trained general surgeons? So everyone did do a post-fellowship time overseas um, in that group that we interviewed. Um, I think there was um, a range of um, personal views on what people were wanting to do in the long run. And definitely some people interviewed were always heading to a smaller centre and some people always heading to an academic centre. And isn't it great that there's such a variety because that's what we need as well. Um, so yeah, there was, a, there was yeah. a mix across the group. And I'd have to say it was deliberate for most people. You know, they didn't sort of fall into no. rural or urban hospitals. They were, yeah, that was definitely part of the mix of deliberate choices that they made. Yeah. And some of that stemmed back from where they'd been sent in their uh, earlier years of training and some of it stemmed from where they grew up as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Christine, as a follow-up to her Radonk comment, says Emmanuel Joe has done this for Radonk as well, along with a Radonk from Dunedin. And I, I, I do wonder, everyone loves the work that Emmanuel Joe does, but it often seems quite hidden and not joined to, you know, broader centralised workforce planning or explicit discussions about who have we got, what do they do, what do we need, where are they, when will we get them? Do you have any comments to make about that, other than, uh, let's get on with it and do it? I agree. He was just an absolute godsend when we were starting out and couldn't believe the amount of work that he had done, um, how generous he was with sharing it with us, explaining it to us, because it's pretty, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> difficult maths. Um, yeah, but absolutely. I mean, you see this um, in all parts of the work that we do is that we find the evidence, we make a business case and then someone else makes the decision and there's no, particularly in workforce planning, no accountability or anything linked to um, what needs to then be done with it. So a hearty agreement from both of us. Yeah, we're also a little bit concerned. Some of, some of our work around this area is, you know, a lot of workforce projections um, have been based on some assumptions that a base year was one where we had sufficient staffing uh, for current need and it's our strong view that that's not the case. So even if we're keeping pace with those assumptions and projections, we'd still be behind the eight ball. 
Um, Murray Barclay, a gastroenterologist and former president, um, he's in Canterbury, said one thing that helps is to sign trainees up to a return to a consultant position before leaving for their fellowship. Comments? 100% agree. That was what happened with me and one of my colleagues. And we came back uh, with, and when we left to go overseas on fellowship training, we were looking at that training with uh, the view of learning as much as I can because I'm definitely coming back to where I'm expecting. You can set your life up at that point in time, you're in your sort of early 30s at the very youngest, but later for some. And you know you've got family and housing and all those sort of things to sort out, and so you can do that. So it was really like perfect. And it, it pains me greatly that we cannot do that at the moment for anyone else. Um, and it all seems to come down to the inability to plan beyond one year at a time, because you can't just give a letter of intent. You have to also have a business case behind that two years in advance or three years in advance before you can make that happen. And people just cannot look that far in the future for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, um, it would be our view that this is something that really needs to change um, with the opportunities, I guess, that Health NZ and the Māori Health Authority pose. Have either of you had any opportunity to engage directly with any of the people who are working with the transition unit um, around this work that you've done or just through your services? No, no. No idea, really, what's going on. <laughs> well, I heard a bit about it this morning on the conference, actually. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> no. I mean, they probably wouldn't have heard of us either doing this because it's only just that we're presenting it now and the paper is um, accepted by NZ Journal of Surgery, but um, it's coming out soon. Yeah. So, so they may not have come across it yet either. Okay, well, we hope that we can continue to, you know, track the progress of this paper and, you know, look at whether there are some opportunities to amplify those findings and apply them across other specialty areas. Marnie Cox says, thank you so much for this excellent work. This rings true for our radiology trainees also. We're about to farewell most of our finishing trainees on overseas fellowships and suspect many or all will not return. And that's particularly poignant given that Marnie works in your DHB and, I, you know, radiology doesn't seem to be in a position to give that certainty in terms of letters of offer or, um, you know, to bring people back. I don't know if there's anything more you want to say about that. Yeah, I reckon the only thing to add is just how depressing it is when you realise that all this training you're doing is for the benefit of another bunch of hospitals and countries, you know, like it, it's, yeah, it's super depressing when that dawns on you and it isn't that motivating actually as a SMO ongoing to think that all the work you're putting in is, you know, not for the good of your country. That's quite interesting uh, in terms of, you know, some of your findings were that, you know, there's a range of factors um, that influence those trainees, but you've just reflected as an SMO responsible for providing training and support. And, you know, this is, you're putting in a lot of time, a lot of energy, you're happy to do it, it's part of your role as an SMO, but then you see that rich resource and all of that time effectively going elsewhere, and that, and that that's very depressing. So that's another factor, I guess, in burnout fatigue, that yeah, those right. job satisfaction um, issues. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that from the point of view of, of the SMO overseeing those trainees? Um, it's not something I've reflected on at great length, to be honest, because it, it, it doesn't necessarily hit you in the face until you have some people that you really wanted to get back and then you can't. Um, and find that they've ended up somewhere else overseas. Um, but I think it is an, an extra consideration. I and mean, it doesn't stop me doing what I love and teaching and training as much as I can, but it just is, yeah, just disappointing because it's not the trainees, it's not that they didn't want to come back, it's just that there was no ability for them to come back at that time. So, yeah, just disappointing, really. Um Emma, you're at you know, a very different point in your medical or surgical career uh, from Marie. Uh, how does it feel from where you're sitting in terms of what you're plotting out, what you're hoping to achieve, where you think you might end up? It has, has doing this piece of research affected the way you're thinking about this or, or some of your strategies around where you hope to get to? Yeah, well, it's actually been nice to apply my background, so 
working in executive recruitment and, and having these kind of conversations all the time in this um, new part of my life because I didn't think that anything that I'd done previously would be at all relevant. So that's that's been nice. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's probably had more resonance um, for the registrars um, that I'm working with at the moment because you know we, we talk about the you know that we're presenting today and then talking about the re the research to them. So they're much further along that career path than I am. Um, and it's very real for them. And you know you do really get to just um, see the fatigue because people you know first it's getting through your exams and then it's getting onto training and then it's moving around the country and then it's seeking fellowship and you know you can just see that um, that accumulated stress and fatigue building up for people um, if you're asking whether it's changed my mind about doing general <laughs> surgery no <laughs> um, but yeah it's um, it's definitely opened my eyes to the challenges of what it's like for trainees, but then to have Marie's perspective on it and to watch, you know, there's so much work goes into um, to training um, everyone that comes through our public hospitals um, and then staying in touch with people as they go overseas and hoping to bring them back, but not being able to offer them anything. I mean, quite a few of the people we talked to said that they'd, um, you know, they've kept those relationships going and they've obviously got mentors that really supported them who were devastated that they couldn't offer them certainty. Um, and so it's just a real, it's just pretty horrible for everyone involved when it's, it seems like something that could be a simple logistical fix offering someone certainty prior to going on fellow. I mean, that just seems like a no-brainer, right? Mm -hmm. Um, this is a speculative question, not sent him. I do have a few more coming in from um, conference participants, but I'm taking advantage of the chair here. Do, you know, <laughs> we've been talking a lot about um, priority given to decision making other than clinical decision making in our health system currently. Do you think that is a factor here too? That when it comes to issues around recruitment and staffing, there just isn't significant clinical voice um, in place? I mean, we can make plenty of noise, but we just don't seem to have the ability to pull money from somewhere to fund the position we want to give someone. And um, it's almost like it's made especially hard on purpose so that you run out of energy to kind of continue. Um, so I guess, the counter argument would be that doctors aren't very good with money and you know it's there's more to it than just getting everyone back that we want so okay so i've got a series of questions and comments from suman uh, this observation suggests health services slash government do not recognize the need to retain this group wage freeze and lack of opportunity in new zealand doesn't help either best option in this scenario is for trainees to go in the areas for which there is a demand in new zealand um, I'm wondering if that's because Suman is a psychiatrist and is suggesting that you, I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding that. So send me a line, Suman, if I've misunderstood that. And just before you comment, if you wish to, um, another possible conclusion from this study could be that this group of trainees knew of this situation and went into this training looking at the lucrative options that opens up overseas. Did this come up as a possibility in this study? We'll answer the second question first, um, and the answer is no. So, and and these are quite long, um, in-depth interviews. I'd spend 30, 45 minutes to an hour with each person, um, and and every single person that we spoke to had intended to come back to New Zealand, um, and I think they were genuine um, in that respect. They do get offered jobs, um, as I say, the majority of them while they were on their fellowships, um, and that's when it starts to. Uh, they start to um, have a look at the different factors, so quality of life and remuneration, um, academic work and things like that, but absolutely not. It wasn't, yeah, I, I don't think anyone <laughs> would choose to do this no. for that reason. No. Thanks. And one more from Suman. Somewhat similar predicament is seen in a smaller special in smaller specialty areas of psychiatry as well. Like um, he's had a registrar with advanced certificate in psychiatry of older persons not getting a job in mental health services for older persons, and therefore moving to Melbourne to work in their area of specialty. So I guess that's just a bit of empathy there from another specialty. And John Chambers, who's an ED specialist in Dunedin, asks perhaps somewhat mischievously as well, is there a parallel universe where young surgeons have their eye on, future, on a future in private practice? 
Um, I think you've covered that off, but do you want to respond? Well, they're quite um, uh, unexpected kind of questions, I guess. Um, I don't think that anyone starting their training really is looking at the private practice options in general surgery. Let's face it, in New Zealand, there's not huge volumes of private general surgery. And uh, I don't think anyone really starts out hoping to go to Australia and earn mega bucks. So it, it's an interesting perception <laughs> by people from outside of general surgery, but I, I honestly don't think that's a feature at all. I, I do think that speaks to how siloed you often are and how few are the opportunities for specialists to talk across scopes. Um, and that's certainly something I really enjoy when we have our JCC meetings, that we get members from across a range of specialties and suddenly you get to actually talk across. Um, so maybe that's something we need to think about more as well. Um, Julian Fuller, um, an anaesthetist at Waitamata, makes the comment, um, it's also... Um, the absolute lack of operating rooms or lists that currently prevents many hospitals appointing surgeons, as at his DHB today. And he asks, horse and cart or chicken and egg scenarios, surely we need to push even harder for bricks and mortar. Yeah, quite a few people talked about um, their, the ones that did get jobs in New Zealand that was contingent on a, a mentor giving up time on their, you know, giving up a list a week or having to tolerate, you know, part-time for 12 to 18 months while operating time became available or clinics became available. So capacity is definitely part of it. Um, we find that too. We sometimes have to step in quite late in the piece where someone has been recruited on all kinds of promises and, and, and this might actually be an established SMO from elsewhere, but and they arrived to find that the promised lists or the promised subspecialty work simply doesn't exist or would only exist if a whole bunch of other people gave up time. And it inevitably leads to bad feeling and often leads to people who've uplifted and you know uprooted their whole lives leaving again. Um, so I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but it, it, it's, it's very frustrating and, and often leaves a really bad taste for people. Yep, yep definitely. I mean, same at my hospital, our hospital at the moment, it, it, you know, same thing, there isn't spare operating lists, there's, there's not, you know, we just re reshuffle everything and backfill things and there's just physically not enough theatres or clinic space to have new, new people having new space, so... I think and to, um, to make Australia more attractive, obviously the, the timetable is produced right at the beginning when the job offers are made and, and you, know, you can see how that might appeal as well. Even so, there seems to be still people willing to come back because they love New Zealand and they love the department they've chosen to come back to and, uh, and happy to wear that for a wee while, not forever, but for a little while. I do think our system needs to do better, though, to, to make those things much more supportive and much more certain. Tanya Wilson, who's another ED specialist, says, thanks, a great study and presentation. I found it interesting that the ministry is looking at the projected workload, FTE workforce, etc. Did you find that they had strategies to address the projected shortfall? No. But, I mean, that was Emmanuel that we were looking at. That's uh, right. Just yeah. his data. Yeah. I don't, you know, we went privy to where that was going or who was acting upon that or not acting upon that. Uh, Clinton Pinto says, kia ora Clinton, terrific work and presentation, big kia ora. Could ASMS take a more active role in this space? So I guess that's partly why we've invited Maria and um, Emma <laughs> to present, just, just saying. Um, <laughs> it is, as Marie says, disheartening and depressing losing trainees. Why don't we point out the financial implications to Health NZ and the Ministry to correct this abject and ongoing stupidity? Good suggestion. Um, happy to pick it up. Do, do either of you want to make any comments back to Clinton or amplifying what he said? Well, I think actually this is what really interests me about research and kind of putting my media and politics hat on is there's so many different ways to get a message out there and you can kind of um, 
you know, go through our normal processes and it was really nice to get this paper accepted into the um, ANZ General Surgery um, to be presenting here, but also to think more broadly about how to present this information. So social media as well, tagging in our, uh, our health ministers, as I see that you've done, Sarah. <laughs> um, but also getting the conversations on the table um, in, in places that you're probably privy to as ASMS and um, and that, that we can as well, talking to people that we know um, and proactively pushing this um, as much as just doing the research publishing side of things as well. Maybe an article, maybe I need to miss the time to something. Make another podcast about it or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great podcast, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Supposed to be studying right now, yeah, so don't give me more jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, it's interesting, uh, those of you who are here for the final presentation um, of the day focusing on our new research looking at psychiatry and mental health, we are taking an actively joined up approach internally to link up the policy and research work, our industrial work and our campaigning work to try and make it a more compelling case, do some direct work with members. So, you know, we do have to be political, we have to hold hands um, with other stakeholders and interested groups. There's just a few more comments and questions. I um, So hang in there. Um, Claire French has come back uh, to say, Julian, really good point, and I agree completely. We have more than enough work for more surgeons um, at our and neighbouring DHBs, but there's nowhere for them to work. Getting lists is a challenge, but the money to build theatres is never available. Um, and I just, Derely, um, I don't know if you know Derely Flower, she's ONG at Auckland, she just says, Kia ora, Emma and Marie, invitation for Emma, there's still room for you in ONG if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to respond to that unless you want to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Lavinia says, this ties in with the earlier corridor about succession planning as well needs to be all tied in better. Recruitment, retention, succession planning. Um, where are the roles of ASMS, RDA, medical council, training colleges, ministry, and Health NZ in all of this? I mean, that's right, Lavinia, we are trying to get people to tie these things together um, much more coherently and proactively. Um, I don't know if either of you want to just take as an opportunity to say anything else on those things agree really yeah um, and also I guess to, to just to comment that if every, anyone's interested in doing something like this that we're you know keen to support or talk to you um, be involved in any way because um, you know as, as I think one of the earlier um, questions um, noted you know there will be some some generalizable things from doing this this work and what other people do so um, and I'm just super curious to see as well <laughs> what else, what's, what's going on in different specialties. So, um, yeah, do, do get in touch. As are we, Emma. So we would really like to work with you to coordinate some of that if we can help because I'm not sure but I'm, what your capacity is for continuing to take on extra things. But <laughs> No, <laughs> but we can give you the information to ask people. <laughs> Hopefully from March. So. <laughs> okay. Um, Jeff Shaw... Uh, says, it is interesting to note the lack of publicly provided services reduces competition with the private sector, thus allowing for increased earnings by surgeons working in private, and the gap is increasing. The biggest loser is the patient, and by extension, the whole country. And Satindra says, they're building a new surgical centre at North Shore Hospital. How much difference is it likely to make? Uh, I'm not sure if that's rhetorical or actual. Um, any comments there? Probably not a lot of difference to Middlemore, to be honest. <laughs> but other than that, I don't know. Great for the shore. Yeah, good for the shore. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's it's it's. I'm not even sure if those things are fully joined up, though. We're really concerned. Obviously, everyone knows about ICU beds these days, um, and there's links, aren't there, between you know, operating theatres, beds in the wards, ICU beds staffing of all of those, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, and like, and like you said earlier today, Sarah, as well, that, you know, um, long-term underinvestment in capital infrastructure, you know, like the, the latest cases out of the Galbraith building at Middlemore, which, you know, is going to be another 
maybe 10 years before it's properly fixed or rebuilt. 20. 20, yeah. that's right, sorry. <laughs> Optimistic. Um, you know, so it's, it's just really compounded um, all of our issues. Yeah, we're a little bit worried that um, there's a mis slightly misplaced belief that um, somehow we'll be more efficient and there'll be some preventive and good public health measures, not that we're against those, that will somehow cause current acute and elective demand to evaporate to a degree that you can cope, and, and we're not convinced that that will be the case. Um, I want to really thank you both for taking the time, certainly to do the research and to do the work on top of your busy loads. Um, and to hang in there and present at our virtual conference. We had hoped to bring you here, but um, obviously it wasn't to be the case this year, but we really value the work that you're doing, um, both in the hospital directly and uh, in the research space and politically. So thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. Uh, ngā mihi nui kia kōrua. Well done. Thank you. So we now have the opportunity of a nearly 15 minute break before we bring um, the last session to you, which is inside the front line of the mental health crisis presented by um, Charlie Chambers and Lyndon Keane. So we're going to give ourselves a 10 minute break and then reconvene for the final session of the day. Kia ora.